What's up, everybody? Darius Daniels here. You're getting ready to watch one of our messages from a series of teachings I did at Change Church right there in New Jersey called Manology. <laughs> I hope it adds value to your life. You know, speaking of Change Church, we're expanding our borders. Not sure when you're watching this, but very soon we're going to be launching a campus in Orlando, Florida. If you know anyone that wants to add value to this ministry and have this ministry add value to them, won't you have them email this address right here on the screens? We'd love to meet them and get to know them and partner with them and see what God's going to do, not just in New Jersey, but in Orlando. We love you. Enjoy the message. All right, fellas, let me hear you say amen. amen. Don't leave me out here by myself. That's all right. You got me? All right. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says, now, when the, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the fruit on the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I want to talk from this subject today. The mute man the mute man ladies and gentlemen i'm not sure i'm not sure if you are aware but the bible clearly claims that we are engineered to excel everyone say excel, excel. in other words we weren't made for mediocrity we don't exist to be average we aren't born for Boredom. We have been crafted by our creator in a way that brings glory to him and adds value to the world. And one of the ways that we accomplish this is through excelling. Our God is the God who excels. The psalmist in Psalms 8 calls him excellent. He is extraordinary. He is unique. He is not ubiquitous. There is none like him. He does exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask, think, or imagine. God is excellent. And this excellent God made us in his image and in his likeness. And this excellent God resides on the inside of us and empowers us to excel and to go to places of possibility that are beyond the limitations of our own capacity and we are enabled and empowered to do and to experience what we could never experience on our own. We have been created. We exist to excel. However, it is also important to note, here it is, that one cannot excel in what they don't understand. Excelling requires understanding. To excel at sports, you must understand the sport. To excel at your work, you must understand the job. To excel in finances, you must understand your financial reality. To excel in relationships, you must understand the one you are relating to. And one of the wisest men who ever lived, a sage named Solomon, he uh, corroborates my claim. He agrees with this argument. He puts pen to paper. And in Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 7, Solomon says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. And then he says, though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Because you cannot excel in what you don't understand. 
And if I had time, I'd pause for a minute and attempt to articulate how the enemy attempts to destroy and disrupt our lives by impacting our ability to acquire understanding. If he can keep you confused, he can keep you stuck. God is not the author of confusion. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and so there are a number of areas that we should all constantly seek to understand, specifically those that are essential and consequential to our lives. However, in this series, we are attempting to increase our understanding of men. You, you may have heard of the subjects of theology and biology and anthropology and sociology, but today I want to add another discipline <laughs> to that discipline of study. We need to explore manology because men need to be understood. In, in, in my years of interaction with thousands of men, I have heard one pervasive consistency, and that is many men feel misunderstood. And a misunderstood man is an unheard man, and an unheard man is a man who doesn't feel listened to, and a man that doesn't feel listened to is a man that will eventually go mute. And here's a question for us simply to reflect on in our time of teaching today. Here it is. Are the men in your life mute? And if the answer to that question is yes, then we need to ask another question. And that is, do the men in your life feel understood? Do they feel heard? Are you listening? Do you let him talk? Do you let him finish? Do you let him tell you what he is saying? Or are you telling him what he is saying? It's, it's, not, it's not the same kind of amens I'm normally <laughs> accustomed to, to, to get in here. Here, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Because if a man doesn't feel heard, he doesn't feel listened to, and if he doesn't feel Listen to the man goes mute. He goes silent. What do I mean? This, this, this text in Genesis uh, makes clear what I'm attempting to claim on today. The, the very first man we are introduced to in scripture, a man named Adam, was a man that became mute. And his muteness had chaotic consequences. Yeah, here, here, in, here in the book of Genesis, it's the book of beginnings. It's the book wherein we are able to explore and understand a number of truths regarding the beginning of the world as we know it, specifically the narrative regarding creation. And we see in creation, God, who's an excellent God, taking a period of time. The Bible says it's a period of six days. Whether that is six literal days or whether that is a metaphor for years is debatable because Peter says a day to God is like a thousand years to us. What we do know over a period of time, God created the world as we know it. Are you following me here? That the, that the world is not some cosmic consequence of a firecracker that went off in the atmosphere that it was strategically orchestrated by an intelligent being that we know as God who made sure that there was the appropriate ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere who made sure that the sun was close enough to earth that we would receive its warmth but far enough away that we would ladies and gentlemen not be burned up by it it's he. It's a God who makes the rain descend, be absorbed by the ground, and then evaporate into the atmosphere. That is not a consequence of some random bang. That is a God who sits high and looks low. That is a God who strategically and intentionally orchestrated our existence as we know it, who 
who made the human species, who put a skull over your brain to protect your brain from unnecessary injury, who put your lungs and your heart to be protected by ribs because they're some of the most vulnerable organs inside of your body, ladies and gentlemen. That is no coincidence. It takes more faith to believe in a big bang than it does an intelligent being who created the world as we know it. Yeah, my belief in God is not irrational, it's rational. It makes sense. Are you following me here? So, so I want you to, I want you to catch this. So he, he creates, he creates, he creates on one day, and then he evaluates what he creates, and then says, it's good. And then he creates on the second day, evaluates what he creates and says, it's good. Third day, evaluates what he creates and says, it's good. Fourth day, evaluates, creates what he creates and says, it's good. Fifth day, evaluates what he creates and says, it's good. Remember now, he's a God who excels. So he didn't say it's good enough. He didn't say it'll do. He said it's good, right? Because excellence requires evaluation, right? But on the sixth day, he created the human species, he created an ish, the, the male gender, Adam. And he looked at what he created and said, it's not good that he be alone. That my intention for my creation cannot be accomplished just with the male gender. So when he says it's not good for man to be alone, he is not saying that every man needs a wife. He's saying humanity needs women. Jesus of Nazareth didn't have a wife. The Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, did not have a wife. The Apostle Paul even encouraged people. He said, if you have that gift and you're able to maintain yourself, he says, it's even better for you that you are single. If you put that juice in the refrigerator this morning before you came to church, when you go back home, that juice is going to be right back in the refrigerator. Whatever mess is at your house, it's your mess. You made it. He, he, he encourages, he encourages people. So, so this is not, this is not a mandate for marriage. He's saying that humanity, the human species, cannot accomplish what I intended it to accomplish without the female gender. He says humanity needs women. Boys need mothers, aunts, sisters, daughters, wives. And after creation, he, he gave Adam and Eve some instruction. He says everything in the garden you can eat from freely. They were placed in this garden, this place called Eden place of unbroken fellowship and communion with God. He says, you can have anything in this garden you want to eat except for that one tree in the middle. Don't touch that. He is teaching them to live as humans as he intended because you can't be, watch this, a fully functioning human without the ability to live with restraint. He's teaching them that if you're going to live the way I intended for you to live, you can't touch everything you want to touch. That if you're going to experience my best, you're going to have to be able to look at things that you like and then decide you can't have it. Be because, watch this, because, because you can't experience God's best without freedom, and freedom is not revealed in your ability to say yes. Freedom is really revealed in your ability to say no, because if you can't say no, you're really not free. If they call you and you can't say no, you're not free. If they text you and you can't say no, you're not free. I don't hear anyone talking to me. If you see it and you like it and you can't walk away from it, you aren't free because freedom is revealed in your ability to say no. He's teaching them that. But somehow, some way, Eve, the Isha, the woman, she's... So I was walking around the garden, and she engages in the conversation with, a, with someone the Bible calls Satan, who's in the form of a serpent. Whether or not this is a literal snake is non-consequential. It's inconsequential. The issue is, this is the point. They were in a garden. They were in an outside environment. Animals were all around. This is the point. The enemy showed up in a form where it looked like he belonged. That, 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 that's the point. He didn't look out of place. He looked like everybody else. There's animals around, so a snake didn't look out of place. Because if he, wouldn't, if he would have showed up looking out of place, Eve probably wouldn't have engaged in conversation with him. So here it is. Eve engages in conversation with him. The enemy doesn't make her, but he influences her to make a decision to touch what God says not to touch. 
She touches, she takes fruit, she eats a part of it, and she gives it to her husband, and he eats also. Now, this is what I want you to see, all right? I want you to see something in Genesis 3. I want you to, in verse number 6, I want you to see this because this is where the, the present Daniels disagrees with the past Daniels. And if your present self doesn't disagree with your past self in any way, that means your present self had not moved on from your past. That, that one sign of growth is that you can look back at the old you and disagree with you, right? So if you don't disagree with anything the old you did, it means that you hadn't grown, right? Because so, I used to preach this passage uh, emphasizing the absence of Adam. I'm like, where's Adam? His wife talking to a snake, he's not around. Where's Adam? His wife is eating the fruit. He's not around. Until I saw a detail in verse 6 that I had overlooked. The Bible says when the woman saw the fruit, she saw it was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. So here it is. The issue in the text is this. It wasn't that Adam was absent. The issue was Adam was silent. Right? Because it's one thing for a man to be present. It's another thing for a man to be vocal. Adam's issue wasn't absence. Adam's issue was he wasn't vocal. He was a mute man. But before we criticize him, I think we need to ask some questions. Before we insult him, I think we need to attempt to understand him. Ooh, I see some interesting faces right here. <laughs> here it is. Why was he mute? Are we assuming that there was no attempt on Adam's part to talk Eve out of it? I don't know. The text doesn't say. So this is conjecture at best. But let me just throw out this holy hypothesis. Allow me to use my imagination to contemporize this conversation. If it was 2018 and Adam was sitting outside the Garden of Eden, I walk up to him and say, man, what happened? He would say, bro. <laughs> bro, listen, I'm chilling in the garden. I'm just trying to watch the calves and the warriors. That's Bro, that's all I'm doing. And Eve, you know, I got here before she did. Now she got here. She want to walk all around the garden. I'm tired. I just want to watch, watch the game. But she wants to see the garden. So I'm going to walk around the garden with her, right? Because I know if I can get this out of the way, I can catch the second half of the game. So I'm just walking around the garden with her. And she walking. She pointing out this. I don't care about the flowers. And she pointing out that. And she just walking around, bro. And then she started walking toward the tree. And I'm like, Eve. Why are you going toward that tree? Bruh. She looked back at me and give it to me, bruh. I say, for real? On oh, God, man. On oh, God. She, she gave it to me, bruh. She said, I'm not going to this tree, Adam. You think I'm dumb going to this tree? I just want to look at the tree. You need to calm down. And then, first of all, why are you saying my name that loud anyway? I'm your wife, not your daughter. I'm a grown woman. I can walk all around this tree if I want to walk around this tree. As a matter of fact, I'm mad I even asked you to come with me. I was having a good time until you came. You just mess up all the fun like I don't know. It's a tree. So she gets close to the tree. Then she starts having a conversation with a snake. And who knows? Maybe Adam said, I don't like you talking to that friend. I'm going to give you a minute to get it because I don't think you did. She, she's talking to a snake. And who knows? Maybe Adam said, I don't like you talking to them. She messy. I don't like you talking to him. I know he say he your friend, but that's a man. And I know what he waiting on. He waiting on that one night you get mad at me. Yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I, I don't like that. He gonna slide right in that inbox. He gonna slide right in them DMs. 
Y'all don't talk. That's my friend. He never tried nothing with me. Uh, all right. Who knows? Adam might, might have said, I don't, I don't like you talking to that snake. That's a snake. I, I don't like the way you talk to me after you talk to her. Because you talk to me the way she talked to her man. I ain't him. Yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not him. She, she, she all in our stuff. I don't trust her. Because anybody ever talk to you about others will talk to others about you. I don't And so I said, okay, bro, so I, 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 get, I get that, but she ate it first. You ain't have to eat it. Why you eat it? Bruh. <laughs> I said, but you know, if when you ate it, you're going to have to deal with God. So would you rather deal with God than her? Bruh. God cast, cast things into the sea of forgetfulness to remember it no more. Bruh, she going to bring it up every week. I'm just, I'm going to try my luck with God. I don't hear anyone saying anything to me. So Adam is muted. He's silent. And because he's silent, Eden is affected. Because he's silent, you and I are affected. Here it is. He says, this, this is just a hypothesis. Rather than deal with the ramifications of trying to confront this, I don't even have this in me. So I'm just going to eat it. Even though I know this isn't the best decision for our family, we probably shouldn't buy right now, but I'm just going to eat it. And I know we probably need to be a little more strict and a little more disciplined with our son because we're trying to prepare him to go out into a world that does not love him the way that we love him and who will not treat him the way that we treat him. And so we have to build a degree of resilience in him. And, and even though I know that's necessary for him because I'm a man and I know what it's like to navigate this world as a man, instead of dealing with everything I got to deal with to get that across, I'm just going to eat it. I don't, I don't even have it in me today. And when men are muted, children suffer. When men are muted, homes suffer. When men are muted, churches suffer. When men are muted, our communities suffer. When men are muted, our country suffers. The enemy wants to silence men on the things that don't matter so that they don't speak up regarding the things that do. So men are being trained to be mute. Act like your needs don't matter. Mute them. But we must unmute men. Because when you unmute a man, you unlock his potential. You enable him to step into his best self. Are you hearing me? We can only be our best when our needs are met, and our needs can only be met when they are heard. So today I want to stand proxy for many men and begin a journey of articulating some things that need to be said. I can't speak for all men. I don't claim to do that. But I want to use my years of coaching, mentoring, and counseling hundreds and thousands of men in a way that positions us to understand them better and serve their needs. I, I, I want to share with you three things that he might say if he was unmuted. Number one, he, he, would, he, would, he would probably say, here it is, Adam would say, I'm not a woman. I'm not a woman, what, what does it mean? In Genesis 2, 18, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone, I will make a helper suitable for him. When God makes this observation about the need for another gender in humanity, he does so because he knows that there's something that the human race needed that cannot be accomplished by man alone. So he made someone different because the human species needed someone different. We are not the same. We are not the same. We're not the same emotionally. We're not the same physically. We're not the same 
mentally, our bodies aren't the same, our brains aren't the same. We don't think like women, we don't feel like women, we don't respond like women, we don't talk like women. And at some point, a woman has to ask herself, do I really want a man or do I want a male version of me? Is this too... <laughs> Because, because it's, un, it's one thing to a man, the concept of us being different. That's conceptually. But it's another thing to embrace that practically. Because when you don't embrace the, the, the differences the, practically, what ends up happening is you can demonize the difference. Right? So that, that means that being a woman being her authentic self is appropriate and acceptable. But a man being his authentic self requires adjustment. Okay, here it is. Here it is. When I say there's a difference, when I say there's a difference, here it is. Number one, I mean four things. Here it is. Number one, when I say I'm not a woman, here it is. It means that Adam has man words. Everybody say man words. Man words. Say it again. Say man words, please. Okay, what do I mean? Okay, <laughs> one, one survey revealed that women speak about 20,000 words a day. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Because we're not going to demonize the difference. However, on the flip side, the same research initiative shows that men speak on average about 7,000 words a day. That is a 13,000 word difference. So sometimes, it's not that a man doesn't want to talk. It's just, I've used up all my words. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sometimes he just ran out of words. Does that mean he shouldn't speak to you? No, we should be strategic as men and we should save some of our words for those that matter the most. But women, you do need to understand that even when I save some words, I don't have 13,000 more. So sometimes he just doesn't want to talk. I'm out of words. Here's the question. Do you demonize that difference? Uh, uh, secondly, not only do I have man words, I have man focus. Women, you can cook dinner or hold a baby, hold a conversation, and correct a child in another part of the room you don't even see. Men? One thing at a time. I can either watch the game or talk to you. <laughs> Fellas, y'all aren't. <laughs> Fellas, you're not helping me. I can either watch the game or talk to you. I cannot do both of them at the same time. And when this difference is demonized, men feel the pressure to lie. And I'm just going to tell you, men lie. Because there are times you're talking and we're watching the game or listening to something. And then the only thing we hear is, did you hear what I just said? And we say, yes, of course I heard what you just said. We did hear you. Wow, we have man focus. Thirdly, we ha I have a man brain. There is a recognizable difference in the male and female brains as early as 26 weeks into their development. I have a man brain. I do dumb things sometimes. <laughs> See, y'all aren't talking to me here. I remember my cousins in Greenwood, Mississippi. I remember that it was this, <laughs> I can't believe this. They took garbage, these big garbage bags, right? 
there was a low roof on the house. And uh, <laughs> they jumped off the roof to see if the garbage bags would function like a parachute. <laughs> and some of you sisters in the room, you would never do anything like that. And this is the thing, a man will watch another man do something like that and not stop him. <laughs> we, we can't just ride a bike. We got to build a ramp. <laughs> ride the bike down the hill and jump off a ramp. And then when you ask us why we did it, we're not trying to make excuses. We really don't know. Why'd you do that? I don't, I don't know. Are you hearing me? Yeah, man words, man focus, a man brain. I'm going to move off of this one. Man needs. All right. Uh, the next point is... <laughs> See, I'm not mentioning these things to make excuses. I'm not attempting to excuse any dysfunction. But what I'm attempting to do is to help us acquire some understanding. Because the Bible teaches you're called to be a suitable helper and you can't do that well without understanding how men are wired. He would say, I'm not a woman. Number two, he would say this. All right. Can we do this? Can everybody say amen before? Say amen right now. Amen. Come on, let's try it again. Say amen right now. Amen. Okay, because I know you're probably not going to say it after, so I want you to say it first. Um, here it is. second thing he would say is, I need nurturing, not nagging. Okay, so, so before we deny that we're naggers, let's at least have a come to a consensus on what nagging is. Right? So before we say that's not me, let's at least say Let's be clear on what it is, okay? So, so Webster defines uh, nagging as constantly harassing someone to do something. <laughs> nagging can come in the form <laughs> of criticisms, comments, and questions. Listen to what Solomon says about it in Proverbs 25, 24. He says, it's better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a quarrelsome wife. You see, when there is nagging, the man's palace feels like a prison. Because the barrage of questions often makes him feel like he's under interrogation. Are you following me here? And sometimes, sometimes helping can even come off as nagging when it is done in an insensitive way. Why'd you do it that way? What were you thinking? Why'd you do All you had to do was this, 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 this. Well, sometimes what is heard, that's not what's meant, but sometimes what is heard is you're stupid. <laughs> that you just made this much more complicated than it could have been, which may be true. But how can I speak that truth in love? How can I speak that same truth in a way that builds up and doesn't tear down? I hear you, though. I hear you. Because some of you are saying, PD, sometimes it seems like the only way I can get through, the only way I can get through to him is by saying certain things a certain way. I understand. You may win the day during that but you lose the man. Here it is. Because just because he stayed doesn't mean he hadn't left. Because there are some men that are so committed to covenant, so committed to their kids, that they will stay. But in their heart, they've left. So, so at some point, you got to ask yourself, do I want to win the task war and lose the man? Or do I want to find a way to nurture, where I see those weaknesses, nurture them, to build them up, to come alongside them, to say, that's why I'm here. Did you hear me? 
to, to see, okay, you're lacking that, but that's why I'm here. That's why God gave you me for a mother. That, that, are you hearing me? That's why God gave you me for a spouse. That's why God gave you me for a daughter. That's why God gave you me for a sister, because you're lacking that. And I'm going to come alongside and be a suitable helper. Because I want to nurture without nagging. Because I never want your palace to feel like a prison. And last but not least, can we say amen again? Y'all still love me? Okay. All right. Is it good we're telling the truth? Okay. All right. Last but not least, a mute man would say, I need appreciation, not just admiration. Admiration is what's felt. Appreciation is what is expressed. And in Luke chapter 17, the Bible reveals something interesting. It says that when Jesus has this exchange and this encounter with healing 10 men who were lepers, one of the men came back to him and thanked him. This man was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked him, we're not all 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Even Jesus says, wait a minute. I want you to have a recognition of my contribution in your life to the degree that your appreciation for it expresses itself by saying thank you. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Is the problem list longer than the praise list? Does he hear, watch this, does he hear only what he's doing wrong and never what he's doing right? Because many men are suffering from feelings of unappreciation. Because men can be a handful and it takes patience to deal with us, doesn't it? But women can too. And just as, just like God is in the process of sanctifying men and growing men and grooming men, and women at times have to be patient in that process, the same work is taking place on the other side. And God is also sanctifying women and growing women and grooming women. And some men have been patient and supportive and accommodating in ways that the average man would not. Have you ever said thank you for being patient with me? Have you ever said thank you for subjecting subjecting yourself to a rigorous work schedule that I know is not in your best interest long term. You are in an environment that's hostile. You, you're being demeaned as a man. Yet because of your commitment to provide for us in this family, you stick to it and stay with it. Th- thank you for that. Now, now here it is. I, I, know, I know you're saying, well, I do that too. Okay. But it's okay to still say thank you. Here it is, because men hang out where they're appreciated. I'm going to throw this out there and leave it alone. Even God shows up when you praise him. You didn't, you didn't hear what I just said. I said even God shows up when you praise him. Psalms 22.3 says he inhabits the praises of Israel. And when we praise God, even God shows up. Do you hear me? I'm not a woman. I need nurturing, not nagging. Am I making sense to y'all? I need more than admiration, what we feel. I need appreciation. Some of you don't have a perfect man. You got a good man. You raised a good son. He ain't giving you no trouble. 
I mean, the worst you have to deal with is he don't take baths. <laughs> Come on, think about it. They don't keep the room as clean. But you, God gave you a good boy. How often does he hear it? So you know what, you're a, you're, a, you're a good boy. Appreciation. My job is to, to the best of my ability, give us truth. And you have to, truth as I understand it at least. And you have to decide whether or not you'll make this truth your truth. And you will have to live with the consequences of the truth you choose to live by. But I'm telling you right now, many men's souls look like deserts. I talk to them. Two things I know I'm called to, leaders and men. I'm called to church, but specifically in a unique way, leaders and men. And I'm telling you, many of their souls look like deserts. But because they don't express themselves verbally, you don't know. Because when a man is empty, he either goes anger or he goes mute. He goes silent. But there's a story in Mark chapter 7 of a deaf and a mute man. I'm done. And his friends bring him to Jesus. Jesus puts his hand in his ear and opens up his ears. And when his ears were opened up, the Bible says his tongue was loosed. Because only Jesus can heal a mute man. So brother, if you feel unheard, I said if you feel unheard, if you feel unappreciated, if you feel like you're not properly valued and your needs are not considered, there's somebody you can run to who will quench the thirsting in your soul. There's someone who will speak over you. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. His name is Jesus. If you're here today, I want you to know, you don't have to die a mute man. When you can go to nobody else, run to him. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you were blessed and encouraged. I'm going to encourage you to press that subscribe button so that you always are notified when we're releasing new content. And if you want to give and be a blessing to the ministry, you can press the give button also. Take care. See you next time.